Welcome to Free Thoughts. I'm Trevor Burris. And I'm Aaron Powell. Joining us today is Brian Kaplan, professor of economics at George Mason University. His latest book is The Case Against Education, Why the Education System is a Waste of Time and Money. Welcome to Free Thoughts, Brian. Very glad to be here. So the book is obviously a very provocative title, especially coming from a highly educated professor. So why are you against education? Well, I see myself as a whistleblower. I've been in school continuously for over 40 years. I've seen an enormous amount of waste of taxpayer money, and I think it's up to me at least to let taxpayers know that they're getting ripped off. I, that's one way of looking at it, but you're not, you're Pretty not straightforward. just against – I mean, you're for – education, but it's the it's about the education system. So yes and no. So, you know, of course I do focus on education as it actually exists. I do also go after the idea that it's a great idea to try to enlighten everybody, even people who are totally apathetic and don't have any interest in the stuff. So I, I, I would say that, you know, the idea that it's a good idea just to enrich everyone by having them learn stuff, you know, whether they like it or not. So I'm, 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 I'm against that too. So then can you, I guess, get at what exactly you mean by education in this case then? So it sounds like you're describing kind of the more classical, you know, we're going we're gonna to read history and literature and learn physics and so on. I mean, do you mean that or you just mean any sort of skill or knowledge acquisition? I mean, I, so what I would say is I, just, I was deliberately vague about that because I don't like to have arguments about words. I just use words in the way that they're commonly used. So when I say education, most people primarily have in mind formal education, although there's also a penumbra of things that are kind of like that, and I criticize those too. But yeah, like most of my focus is on the, you know, the education system, formal education, although even the idea of informal education is something that it's a good idea to ram down everybody's throats. Uh, you do take that on too. The education, though, is a, is a public good, isn't it? That's the kind of thing where you have to actually go and look at the data to find out whether it's a public good or not. Uh, the main thing that I say is actually it's much more like a public bad, uh, where individuals acting selfishly tend to get too much education rather than too little, which is the hallmark of a classic public good. And again, the reason that I say is that most of the payoff from education doesn't come from acquiring skills, it mostly comes from getting certified, from having an institution say, this person is a grade A worker, let's put some stickers on his forehead. And then the key interesting thing about that is that if everyone has a bunch of stickers on their forehead, then to get a good job, you need to have even more stickers than other people, uh, which leads to one of the primary features of the modern labor market, which is massive credential inflation. Uh, it's very hard to get a job even as you know, maybe a waiter without a degree that would have made no sense to someone 70 years ago. So now it's very common for college graduates to be waiters or bartenders. 70 years ago, this wouldn't have been so. It's not like there's been an increase in the cognitive skill required to be a waiter. You know, the real story is just that when a ton of people have degrees, then if you want to compete, you need to have a bunch of degrees too. So then do your students not learn anything? So the answer is that my students, by, by, on the day of the final exam, at least a lot of my students have learned a lot of stuff, however, it's stuff that they're probably never going to need to know again unless they become professors. Then out of those students, the fraction that actually remember the material a couple years later, I think that's really low. And then, you know, even if they, you know, you know, so even if they ever were in a position where they might apply what I taught them, the problem is people are really bad at that. So there's a whole lot of experimental educational psychology that just tries to see how good are people at applying what they learned in one context in a totally different context when there isn't anyone to go and say, use the information you learned on problem one to solve problem two. If you don't have that kind of guidance, then what educational psychologists say is most people, even who remember the material, just won't think to access it when opportunity presents itself. But they, they learn how to read and think about problems yeah, yeah. and, and, yeah, and they learn something. Yeah, and is it like mental so, gymnastics or like some sort of mental muscle? Even if you don't remember the exact w meaning of something you taught in class, like uh, you know supply and demand and how to negotiate, solve prices and stuff, you are better at thinking maybe when you leave than when you went in. Right, right. So just to back up a little bit. So I mean, I absolutely agree that some of the stuff that people learn in school is very useful. So literacy and numeracy primarily. And then depending upon what your job is, you might actually use engineering or computer science or you know, even English or history. Uh, however, uh, this idea that if you've forgotten everything that you were officially taught, there's still some residual learning that's not measured and it's there somewhere. Uh, this idea has been studied empirically for over a century now by people who really want to find something. 
and this is educational psychology, there's a whole field that they call transfer of learning that plays a crucial role in the argument. And the main thing they find is that they just can't find it. I, you know, there's this very little sign that, that people actually learn general thinking skills, uh, you know, you know, like, you know, and especially that if you're trying to teach them one thing, that they pick up something else. I mean, the, like the real story is more that people don't even really learn what you try to teach them. You know, you know, so if, you, if they don't even really learn much of what they're officially tested on, something the stuff that you're constantly trying to teach them, the amount that they learn of other things is just minuscule. Now, again, if you say, but some people do know how to think, how did that happen? Well, again, this is all based upon you know, statistical analysis. So there could still be a very rare number of people who learn how to think, and they're just so uncommon that they don't show up in the data, which is, well, I think, a reasonable story. Is there value, though, in simply the exposure? So let's set aside like elementary school level. We're talking like high school and then on into college that you having this stuff crammed down your throat, as you said, introduces people to new things and so new ways of living or new career paths that they would not have necessarily been aware of. So I went to college thinking that I was interested in one thing, but the exposure to the ideas and the various topics that you know I had to take as core requirements and whatever else led me down a new path that I would not have ended up on otherwise. Yeah, I call this the tasting menu idea of school. And as an ideal, I think it's great. So if, if young kids could really be exposed to a wide variety of different plausible life paths, and then they could you know, find out of each one through experience and then get some ideas about what they might like to do with their lives, that'd be great. Uh, but if you look at actual education, it's very different from that. You know, in K through 12, basically you're exposed to this ossified list of maybe eight options, almost none of which are realistic. So, oh, I could be a poet, I could be a novelist, I could be a professional athlete, an historian, right? And like, you know, again, these are all fields that you expose people to, but once they're exposed, it's like, well, where do you go from there? There's almost no jobs in these areas other than to teach the very subject, certainly, you know, for music, acting, you know, drama. All these areas are ones where you may, you're giving people a sampling of something where it's just pie in the sky. The odds that anyone would actually ever do it is very slim. And then again, college, this college is the same way where you study a bunch of subjects, most of which have bear no relation to any plausible career path. You know, what's very striking is, you know, like you take, you know, take a look at something like the psychology major, you know, like every year we graduate more psychology undergraduates than there are working psychologists in the country. So it's not the kind of thing that it's the kind of thing where you kind of give people this false idea that they might be able to do it when most of them never will. Now, I remember when I was intern at Cato many years ago, Carl Hess Jr. came and talked about a ex educational experience he had when, uh, that his dad, Carl Hess Sr., set up. And basically what his dad did is said, all right, so I want my son to learn about a bunch of different options. So his dad called up like 26 friends in 26 different industries and said, can my son come and work for you for two weeks and filled up a whole year uh, for his son to go and explore. Now here he was supposed to 26 different things that actually are happening that are realistic for him. That would be a great idea. But you know, to go and defend the existing education system, only like for giving, exposing people to a bunch of options, and like, you know, it's it's really is a pretty short list of options that we've just been repeating for centuries, unfortunately. Is there a divide in the way that we think about education, and or I guess I there is a divide in the way we think about education, and I wonder how that divide plays out in this thesis, because on the one hand, there's the education as job training. It's to you know provide you with the skills to go out into the world and find a lucrative career. And so we get the push. This is where we get a lot of the push for, you know, we need lots of STEM programs in our high schools and colleges. Um, and then on the other side is the education as enrichment, as kind of building up a a body of knowledge or at least an exposure to a body of knowledge that that forms kind of the basis of our shared humanity and our cultural history, um, which isn't necessarily about job training. Um, and there you know, are, as you said, very few jobs in those kinds of fields. Are both of those equally bad from your perspective? Should we be focusing more on one than the other? So here's what I say. You know, education and job training, you know, given how unhappy most people are in school, if you can say, yeah, well, you're unhappy, but you're going to get some useful training and just you know, suffer through it, and then you'll have a better future, at least that argument's coherent. Um, you know, most of my skepticism about the second story about you know, like, like building appreciation of ideas and culture is just almost no one acquires this appreciation. In fact, I think, you know, there's probably a good number of people who are turned off to ideas and culture just because they have such a horrible experience in school. Uh, but in terms of you know, this conflict, 
I mean, it's very common for people to say, well, sure, you're an economist, and economists have this very narrow bean counting view, so they're focused on this job training view. But again, if you go and actually look at surveys of students and ask them, why are you in school? What are you doing? By far, the normal answer is the economist answer. I'm here to go and get a better job and make more money. And, I, and there's no way I'd be here if it weren't for, the, uh, for, for that, for those prospects being dangled in front of me. So I say in terms of what most students are in school for, I think it really is for, you know, for, the, uh, for the, the, this uh, career preparation or at least for opening doors to the career that they want to do. Uh, so, you know, in, in terms of how we're, uh, we're doing that, I think you know, like, you know, education does a fine job of opening doors. It just does a bad job of actually training people for those jobs. And again, you say, well, like, why does it really matter which is which? Well, I say, well, selfishly speaking, it doesn't really matter. So whether, the door, you, whether you open the door or whether you improve yourself doesn't really make any difference. But from the point of view of taxpayers, it makes all the difference in the world. Because if what taxpayers are paying for is to improve workers, then... When those workers go out in the you know, go out into the world, they they produce more stuff and they enrich the world more than they would have. On the other hand, if you're just getting just opening doors, well, everyone can't have the doors open for them. If the doors are open to everyone, then they're open to no one really. Then you just need to have add another inner door to go and weed out people. The enormous mass of people made it through the outer door. So again, and that's again what I'm talking about with credential inflation about how as education has spread, the main result isn't that everybody's got a really great job, but the main result is you just need a lot of degrees just to get a mediocre job. I'm curious, do those answers stay the same over time? So you, you may ask the students who are in it right now what they're in it right now for, and they say, well, because I want to get a job. But if you go back to those people when they're, you know, in their 60s or older and say, what do you think you got out of your education? Like, would you have done it if, you know, if you had to do it over again, would you? And what did you find valuable? Do they give that same answer? Do they say it was job training or do they say, no, I got something else out of it? That's a great question. So as far as I know, that survey's never been done. It's just too hard to actually manage. It's easy to go and survey students when they're in school, hard to go and, and survey them when they're out of school. I think you're probably right that older people are more likely to go and endorse this grandiose story about how they were improved as human beings and learned to appreciate ideas and culture. And that's where I really do think it's important to go and to say, all right, so right, tell me what books you read this year. Tell me what movies you saw this year. Right. And you, like, like what you will find is even people that you think of as well educated have very low brow tastes, don't say are not, in fact, interested in, like, in terms of the way they allocate their time in ideas and culture. You know, of course, with a few rare exceptions, like people listening to this podcast, you guys, you guys are great. <laughs> but but again, like if you think about most of your classmates, the idea that you would be listening to this podcast is like, well, why? When I could go and just and just watch late night television or watch sports or whatever, this is what normal people actually choose to spend with their time, whether they're 20 or 60. So, you know, and one of the main themes in my book actually is to be very careful when people give you an answer that sounds like people want to hear it. So I mean, in the book, I have a, a section on what I call social or what's called social, de social desirability bias. This is what psycholo psychologists name for the very human trait of wanting to say and believe things that sound good and make you seem like a nice person. Right. And, you know, when you're 60, someone says, well, what did you really get out of it? Oh, I, I got this great appreciation and made me a human being, blah, 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 blah. But again, it's important then to go and look at behavior and see if is there a gap between what people say and what people do. And there totally is a world of difference between what people say, which is what people want to hear and what they do, which is what they actually like. Now, I want to just uh, clarify. We've touched on it a bunch of different ways, but <clears throat> in terms of clarifying the, the exact sort of debate that your book wades into – and Aaron, we've kind of Aaron kind of mentioned it too, but the the debate is kind of the human capital theory of education versus the signaling theory of education, and that that's been going on for a while, correct? Uh, yes, yes, and no, actually. So in terms, of, you know, so you know, just just to back up, so you know, there's two main stories about why education raises earnings that social scientists tell, which it does, you know, right? I mean, yeah, that, that's absolutely yeah, yeah, true, yeah, which it does. Uh, again, the human capital story says, look, school is a skill factory. You go in there, they pour skill into you, and then you are better and you produce the extra earnings that you get after graduation. Uh, the signaling model says, no, 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 different story. What's really going on is you go there, you jump through a bunch of hoops, and if you do well, they put stickers on your forehead saying, grade A worker. And then, once again, the labor market treats you better. All right, now, uh, you're, in a sense, you're right. This debate has been going on since the 70s, but 
the I mean, really, really, the main debate is just in terms of pure theory. So, like, Michael Spence won a Nobel Prize for for uh, for his work on the signaling model of education. So, in terms of you know, like just the pure math of what's going on, there's been a lot of a lot of, ba- of give and take over the last uh, 40, 40, 45 years. But in terms of empirical work, in terms of understand of saying which model actually fits the world. Uh, human capital has always had had the upper hand by uh, by a lot and continues to have the upper hand, right? And again, that's really why I wrote the book because I think that it does not deserve the of the upper hand. There's an enormous mass of evidence from many different disciplines that are all very supportive of signaling, and and uh, and very hard for the human capital model to explain. And I don't want the signaling model just be stuck in this ghetto of high theory, even if it's a ghetto with Nobel Prize winners in it. I think it's something that we should take seriously as a description of the way actual education actually works. And to be clear, you say several times throughout the book that you're not making the claim that there there is no human capital gain yeah, from course, education. Of course not. That would be crazy. So yeah, literacy and numeracy are genuinely taught in school. And you know, there's you know, so computer science, people learn that in school, and you use that in the jobs. So there's yeah, there's, there's plenty of stuff that people do learn in school that is useful to them one day, but it is. A, but I still say it's a small minority of the time that people spend in school, and it's a small minority of the explanation for the rewards that that you get in the labor market. How much though of what we learn in school after? So in elementary school, you learn how to read. and and you also learn some math, um, and that continues on in middle school and high school. But how much then of the other stuff that we do, so the history and the social studies and all of the stuff you do as part of a general arts and sciences curriculum at the undergraduate level, is just reinforcing that literacy and numeracy that, you know, at some point, like it's not enough to just know how to read words, but you have to be able to learn how to read complicated things and pull the ideas out of them. And the way you do that is by studying complex topics in written form uh, and similar with Math, so that that stuff, you know, if we took if we took those things away, we would lose a degree of the literacy and numeracy. Yeah. So in the book, I try to ballpark how much of that stuff could really be going on. I guess the main big fact to know is that your description of what people are learning in, uh, you know, like in K through twelve, is optimistic even for college graduates. So you know, like the fraction of even college graduates who can read read, read a complex text and pull much out of it, you know, that's maybe you know, you know so you know, you know, maybe, maybe like the top quarter to a third of college graduates could actually uh, like be be even decent at tasks like that. So you know, like if for for people who who, uh, who finish high school and then stop college, like hardly anyone actually ever gets to that level. But yeah, but you know, like like your more general point of just reinforcing, you know, like just to get basic literacy and numeracy, which you know so many American adults still don't have. Uh, you know, like so, you know, like like by you know, like you know, again, some of the, some of the best uh, studies, of adults maybe like about a third of adult Americans are only semi literate, numerate, can barely do things like 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 consult a TV guide and figure out the time and things on, can barely fill out a registered mail form correctly, things like this. So you know, there you go. So there is probably a, you know like you know some marginal improvement there. But again, like, it's it's just not a very good way to actually improve the skills that, that people have. Like you really want to go and focus on exactly the kinds of tasks that you plan, expect to be doing. This is one of the big lessons of educational psychology is that people need to practice the very thing they're going to do. Going and teaching them something that's very different from or much harder than what they really need to do generally just you know, like leads to some improvement in that task, but you know, like, you know, but not much in, in what they really need to actually learn. So, yeah, so I mean, if you really want to get people reading, you know, like reading better, better just give them you know basic texts and like, like work your way up from there, not give them something, you know, like have them read Thoreau and try to analyze it, which you know, most people will never do. So when you say most people will never do, there's a there's an underlying sense this might be kind of there's almost a determinism here. Uh, so I wanted to ask about that because are you saying that when we so when we say that say only a third of college graduates can read and comprehend complex tasks. Is is that because the tools, the way that we're going about educating students up through college to get them to read complex texts are not well thought out, not very powerful, could be better? Or are you saying that there's just the majority of people will never be capable of doing this? Like no matter how good our training was, no matter how much time we put in, they're just never going to be at this level cognitively or whatever else? Yeah, so I'd say it's a mixture of the two. So you know, 
I remember when I was talking to psychologist Steve Cece and I was asking him, is there any known cognitive task where people, where, where, where people can't be trained to, to, to do better or practice doesn't work? And, you know, like he has an encyclopedic knowledge of the discipline, thought about it for a couple of minutes and said, no, there's no known task where practice does not improve performance. So, yeah, I mean, I, 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 I'm very confident that you can improve people's performance in anything. At the same time, however, there are many people where the amount of practice they would need would be, you know, 10 or 20 years. So uh, you know, there, there, is, there is that, that it would just be, just be highly impractical to actually do it. But again, it's not that it's totally impossible, but it's just that it's not realistic. But that seems like a lot of people would be quite offended by, by sort of saying we're going to give up on some of these people and just assume that they're not going to read or care about Shakespeare or understand certain things or think about bigger ideas later in their life. That seems kind of A, elitist and B, just you know, so inegalitarian that it would offend uh, sensibilities of most Americans. Yeah, I mean, the, you're probably right on that. Uh, you know, of course, it may be that they'd be happy to do what I say if I, if I just rebranded it. So, I mean, you know, here's the way that I think about all of my work. My strength is you know, getting to the bottom things and saying it very clearly. Uh, other people have the, may have the strength of marketing it in a way that it becomes palatable. Uh, I don't know. I mean, on the, the elitism point, I'd say, well, like, which is more elitist to say that some people are never, are never going to appreciate Shakespeare or to say that everyone ought to appreciate Shakespeare? I mean, I, I mean to me, like both, they're, they're, there's an elitist ring to both of them. They're two incompatible views. So, I mean, I would be inclined just to say that people think that it's not worth living unless you savor Shakespeare. I mean, I'd say, why not just call them the elitists and complain about that? But, you know, like, the other thing is just that, you know, this offense has a very high cost because there are you know, a lot of kids who just hate school. They find it super boring. And if we have a system where everyone gets prepared for college, even though it's totally unrealistic to think that they are going to succeed in college, then you wind up wasting an opportunity to teach them something else. Uh, you know, and this is why I have a chapter in the book on vocational education and how great it is, especially for kids who just don't like school and people who'd rather go and learn how to do something practical. And again, from the point of view of society, saying so like, I mean, wouldn't it be far better, you know, even to train someone to be a good McDonald's worker than for them to end up in jail, which again is where a lot of our, a lot of a lot of American kids who just don't like school end up, right? So they they're pressured to go and study stuff that has no interest to them. And then they're told that they're not good at it, which they're not. And then finally, they just drop out. And then a like, very high rate of turning to crime. Wouldn't it be better if, they, if from a much earlier age, from when they were 13 or 14, just train them to do any job at all so that they are part of the workforce and are independent, self-supporting adults? I, I understand. I think that there, there's a term for these sort of, I guess, this in the signaling model and, and other situations where you can have a destructive equilibrium and like mm -hmm. the classic case is standing up at the concert where oh, yeah. if if some, if people in the front row stand up, then everyone has to stand up and no one can see any better. And there's a first mover problem where no one can sit down and, and make everyone else sit down, a collective action issue. And of course, that could go on for a while. You could have People then bring boxes to stand on, and everyone has to stand oh, on yeah. boxes. Yeah. And then you could, you could eventually, everyone could be standing on a hundred boxes. Uh, and 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 if you're the guy there saying, "Hey guys, we could just take away all of our boxes and not have to spend money on the boxes and still see in the same way," that would be generally a good thing. Now that makes sense in like that concert example, but oh, yeah. it seems really hard that to imagine how. If this is sort of what education is doing, is okay, we all got bachelor's degrees, so that's like a box we're standing on, and then we got to get master's degree even to be a waiter. It, it seems like it would not be as stable and persistent as it has been for so long that no one could come along and say, hey, guys, this is a little bit crazy, especially when there's profit in it. I mean, if you said, if you were here saying, I've discovered that the steel industry wastes $100 billion a year or something like that, most or 800 or a trillion, however much the, the education system is wasting, most economists would say, you're probably wrong because the steel industry would figure that out and they have a lot of incentive to figure that out. And so why isn't that happening in education? Right. So two things. First of all, there's almost a trillion dollars of government subsidies on the side of the status quo. So the current system has not passed the market test, not by any stretch of the imagination. So all that you really need for my story to be right is that governments will go and throw throw bad money after good endlessly, like with, with like you know, decade after decade, 
Um, my first book, The Myth of the Rational Voter, argues this is totally reasonable because you know, like voting is not like being a shareholder in a, you know, like like in, in the steel industry or being a manager in the steel industry. It's not like being a shopper. You know, if there's a pro- if there's a product that's junk, you know, there's the toenail fungus cream that doesn't work. If you're an individual shopper, you just don't buy it, and even if everyone else insists that it works, you've saved your money. But if you vote on what's the best toenail fungus cream. And, every, and most people disagree with you. There's no real gain to you of being the naysayer or trying to change it. So, I mean, like just remembering all the government subsidies in favor of the status quo, that's one big part of it. And on top of it, uh, you know, the other thing is that one of the big things that education signals is conformity, saying, look, I understand the norms of the society. I comply with them. I don't rock the boat. I go along with things. And if that's one of the things that you're signaling, then I say there's an, there's an inherent lock in there. Because if someone comes up with a really new, imaginative way to signal conformity, what have they really signaled? They signaled non-conformity, right? So I say this is a catch-22. So you know, I think there is something special about things like education, where you know, government support aside, it's just like you don't want to be the uh, the uh, the, per, uh, the person, or you don't want to be the parent of the person who goes and does, does start signaling things a weird way because the world holds it against you. I wonder how much of it. Is also less from the side of you know conformity or um, or incentives not to change things, but just that in this country the people who tend to set the policy, be in a position to make decisions about these kinds of issues, the ones who would you know have to lead that charge, also tend to be the kind of people who did get something out of their education or did find it valuable or did like it. And so they – there's – because I, I often – people seem to just assume that everyone else is like them. So like that I got – I would you know do college again in a second um, and in fact would probably spend the rest of my life taking classes if I didn't have to earn a paycheck. But you know, But I'm weird in that way. But but there's a tendency for people in my position to kind of assume everyone else is like us. Right. So I mean, you know, your general point that people tend to think that everybody's like them is right, and I think that's a lot of why professors are so gung ho on education is they had good experiences. They think everybody else is having them. I don't think that's quite so true in the business world. I think there's a lot of people in business who just thought that school was a joke and they just game the system in order to get the credentials and now they you know they look back and say that was really silly. Uh, so you know I mean there's probably some tendency for people you know, who were involved with hiring to have been relatively good students and so they may have some, they may have some halo effect for them. But again, I would say that this is a case where, where the, what Trevor was saying makes sense, where if it really were the case that there's a lot of qualified people that uh, you could get for lower wages if you would just be if you just go and hire people without credentials, if that really were a viable business strategy, I do think it would be happening right now. So in my mind, the main thing to explain is why why it is that for, that it's not profitable to go and be more open minded, and what I say is that. You know, like you know, since one of the things education is signaling is conformity, you don't want to get these open-minded people who are talented but didn't go and do regular credentials. You're worried this person won't be a good worker; they're going to rock the boat. Does does the signaling model does it do enough to explain why, at least as I'm not an education policy analyst, but from little I know about, say, the Western world, the OECD OECD world, that the the education system is generally the same, at least in the things that we're talking about. You take a bunch of useless classes from five years old and you continue to take useless classes and all this stuff. It seems that why would it be, if that's true, I I mean, I know Germany and stuff have a little bit differences, but if that's generally true, why isn't there a country out there just breaking the mold and destroying everyone in, in you know, cost-effective education systems and effective worker job placement strategies? You know, there are big differences in the amount of GDP the different countries spend on education. And, you know, again, important to remember, so, you know, like if, if you're spending 6% of GDP on education and then you manage to cut it down to 3, is that going to give you a dramatic change in the standard of living in that country? Like 3% might, might not even be noticed, uh, you know, all, all that much. Uh, but again, in term, of course, it still adds up to many hundreds of billions of dollars. So this could still be super wasteful, nevertheless. In terms of like why we don't see that much variation, it's worth remembering. So like they're all supported by their governments. Like every single every single country, there's heavy government support for education. So there's very little individual advantage in trying to do something else, right? Why is it the taxpayers in at least one country don't say, hey, this is our money, don't waste our money? 
Uh, I'd say, you know, like that, you know, if if you if that question is on your mind, I would say it should be actually be very general. So if you think there's a, you know, so again, if you think that there's a lot of government waste everywhere, then you might wonder like why don't taxpayers open up to it or you know, like notice it. And again, I say you know, like in my book, The Myth of Rational Voter, my first one, I say, look, like voters, like there is very very little, in fact, basically zero individual incentive for a voter to look at the world calmly and realistically. Instead, people vote based on wishful thinking. Right. And education will transform our society and it's great in every way. That's the kind of wishful thinking that resonates with human nature all over the world. Um, and as, as for why that is, you know, like, you know, there's there's human universals. There's like, like saying, think of the children makes a lot of evolutionary sense that that kind of kind of rhetoric would ha- would, would touch human hearts all over the planet. So, you know, like, I think that's, you know, that ma- it makes a lot of sense. And same thing, you know, like with love of country and we have to stand up to our enemies and like, again, you know, like all of these political slogans that are often false, but nevertheless are endlessly appealing and are a great way for a politician to to get power. You know, like all this stuff is out there. How much from an employer's perspective does education, especially credentialed education, function almost like a minor league in sports that you know, I don't have if I if I have a job opening and I've hired a fair number of people in my time at Cato, you know, you get hundreds of resumes sometimes, even more, and and you've got to go through them. And so the things that you look for, aside from just, you know, basic ability to write a grammatical cover letter and so on, is well, experience. But for for people who don't have work experience, they can't have work experience to draw on. So you can't you can't use that to see, you know, what are they capable of, how long have they been employed in different places, were they, you know, a good employee so they lasted a while or not. So so college just serves as another way to get there. That, you know, I don't college may not have taught them anything, but I know that if they made it through, they possess a basic ability to do work, to stick with things, to show up on time, to complete projects. And and so even if we, you know, even if they're not necessarily getting anything out of it, I don't want, you know, switching to a system where it's just, as you said, the kind of bright, unschooled person, there may be those out there, but they're awfully hard to find and it's a higher risk because I don't have that kind of baseline metric I can use to judge just the fundamental competence. Right. I mean, that, that all makes perfect sense. Uh, in fact, that's pretty much my argument. But what I'd say is if you went back to 1945 when only the 25% of students had finished high school, back then you could use the high school degree to do the same thing that you now use the college degree to do. So you know, that's what, where, where, uh, where, 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 Tre- where Trevor's analogy of standing up at a concert and getting more and more boxes is, is exactly on point. That of course, when everybody else has degrees, then you're going to get passed over. You don't have one. But does it make sense for government to pour money onto the system to improve access if the main effect is just that you need more degrees than ever in order to even get someone to take a good look at you? Um, so then again, remember, like all these government subsidies are there. It does make life easier for employers in a way, but you know, always important to ask the, you know, the Bastiat question, which is, well, what would we have instead? Right. So, and what I, you know, I say is, you know, like if we didn't have the system, what we'd have instead would be a lot more apprenticeships, a lot more on the on the job learning. You know, there's this, there's so many other possible ways that we might be certifying worker quality, right? But yeah, but your but your mechanism is exactly right, especially you know, like you know, to get your foot in the door. So, I mean, one common objection to the signaling story is just that uh, employers will once you're hired, employers will find out whether you're worth worthwhile, and they'll 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 flush you, they'll fire you in a few months if you're not any good. I say, like, even if that's true, you're not going to be observed for three months until you get hired in the first place. And if people throw away the applications for anyone who doesn't have a college degree, then, of course, you're going to get one. It's super valuable to get your foot in the door if that's the only way you can ever even get considered based upon your merits. It still strikes me as incredibly odd in this sort of $20 bill lying on the sidewalk problem that that employers could open up their – their applications and have a test and have an IQ test or have some sort of other test and say we're we're, we're you know we're willing to take anyone uh, even if you've never gone to college you know if you go through these these three hours of tests and we've figured you know, I mean it it, it I, your point is well taken it just it, it right. just well, seems like there's all, this twenty dollar bill how big the pool of qualified but uncredentialed people is. 
So if you know, like half the people that you're throwing away would be good for the job, then yeah, there's a twenty dollar bill on the sidewalk, and employers are going to profit if they become more open minded. But if you're down to a world where only five or ten percent of the people you're throwing away would have been worthwhile, in that case, it makes a lot of sense to say, well, to be like to ju judge people more fair, you know, more fairly or not more individually, we'd have to spend five times as much time in hiring, and that's really expensive and distracting to people who have who create a lot. Now, on the question of why not just substitute standardized tests, um, you, know, you know, there is there is a view that I attack in the book that that uh, IQ testing for employment is illegal in the United States. I um, mean, you know, I kind of believed it myself until I actually looked at the facts and said, no, it's you know, like while there are some court cases that put put up some some uh, hindrances to that, they're not very effective, and the cost of and, and the expected legal cost of going into uh, giving IQ tests to hire is very small. And like maybe maybe if you're a very high profile company, you might have trouble getting away with it, but almost any mid sized employer could use IQ tests if they wanted to use them for hiring. So my story about why IQ tests are not being used much more widely, you know, they are used to some extent, but just not that often, is that if you did, if you were to go and start hiring high IQ people without credentials, the problem is you would get the the people who have high IQs, but either they're lazy or they're nonconformist. So either the people don't work very hard or they're just defiant and difficult. And I know a lot of people like that, actually, people who are really <laughs> smart, but I would never hire them once because I know their personality. And and generally they are the less you know, my less credentialed friends, but you know, I love them, but I don't want to hire them. Are there industries that are moving in this direction or are better at it? Like I'm thinking specifically of the the technology and startup scene, which seems to place less emphasis on having that Stanford computer science degree and more on just being a really good coder. Uh, so there's a lot of rhetoric to this effect. Although my view is that when you actually go and try to get you know, get get beyond anecdotes, the statistics, the system, you know, if anything, the IT is more credentialist than it was 30 years ago. So again, like this, like the story that I've heard from insiders is like this: back in the 70s and 80s, if you could program, no one cared whether you had dropped out of high school, and there was a big enough pool of good programmers who had dropped out of high school or at least hadn't gone to college that it was foolish in those days to be so snobby and say we're not going to consider you. But now the 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 fraction of good of good coders who didn't go to college is very is actually quite low. So it's once again it actually makes more sense now to be finicky and snobby. And to say, eh, we're not going to really worry about those people. Now, I have asked about, you know, like, I mean, I, I've had some friends at Google, and they, and, they, and I said, well, I've heard that sometimes you hire someone who just wins a, a coding contest, even regardless of their credentials. And like, yeah, yeah, that's true. I said, so how good do you have to be to get into hired by Google without an actual degree, just by winning a contest? And, and I my again, like, this is all just you know off the record. Not no, this is not uh, you know closely verified. But you know, the story that I've heard from insiders is. Yeah, maybe we hire five people a year who don't have formal credentials, but are, but won contests. And then I said, and then like, how many people do you hire a year who didn't win contests but have awesome credentials? I'm like, yeah, thousand, thousands. So you I mean you have to be way better to get in through these back doors, although it does happen. I think I want to ask you a que uh, question about a quote, just one line you had in in the book. Um, Fifty years ago, college was a full time job. You said that 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 it was very, very different in terms of how much effort and, and things it required. Um, why why would that have changed in that way, do you think? Yeah, that's, that's a great question. So I think a big part of it is just that as the number of kids that are going to college has increased, uh, again, like you know, the actual academic interest and preparation of these kids is so low that you have to sort of make it easier in order to give them any hope. So there's that. You know, like if you're a professor, you don't want to fail half your class. So if you start lowering standards a lot, then it's very automatic that you just start make, making it easier so that so that people can hack it. Uh, so I think that's a big part of it. Uh, I mean, something else is just to look at it from the professor's point of view. So to me, what's really amazing is that professors don't just give all A's right? because it makes your life easier, right? And there's almost no pressure from higher from higher ups in the administration to not do that. Really, the, the, the main constraint, the main thing that stops professors from just saying, hey, it's for everyone, is their own academic conscience and just the thinking, I could not, as a decent economist, go and give A's to kids who can't even draw supply and demand correctly. Uh, so in a way, in terms of the self-interest of the people who actually have, hold the power, what's puzzling to me is that college isn't even easier. 
So again, like back in the old days when the students were high, were, you know, like were just better students and more motivated, then you know, then when you're making this trade off between well, what does my conscience allow and what makes my life easier? Those days you actually assigned a lot of work. Nowadays, uh, you know, like it's very tempting just to cut corners, and most professors give in to those temptations. Uh, I mean, it, it, I agree. It is a bit puzzling from a signaling point of view how easy college is. And uh, blogger Noah Smith has said, oh, this is why signaling can't be true. And I say, well, to understand how easy something is, you just have to look at the completion rate. So, you know, like if only 40 percent of full time college students finish uh, finish their degree on time, then clearly for 60 percent of people, this counts as hard. It may be very puzzling as to why they find it so hard, because you say, can't you just find some really easy major and just do the bare minimum and that's it. But like you can lower standards a lot and still there's a lot of people who struggle to get over them or at least like like they you know struggle to get out of bed in order to bother to go to the exam. Is that the number, 40 percent? Yeah. So 40 percent is, is a good number for the share of full-time students who finish in four years. If you go up to five years, then it's like 55 percent. Six years is like 60 percent. There's a, there's a little bit of an issue with students, with transfer students. So you may need to, to bump the numbers up a little bit to take that into account. So if, if we're going to try and start fixing this, uh, I mean, what, what do we what do we do in this? I mean, we have, it seems like there's some problems we would have if we had a free market education to begin with. One would be that uh, maybe 14 year olds don't really know enough to invest in their own future if they're taking loans and things like this, or they're, maybe people won't want to invest in their future if they're going to a bank and saying, I'd like to, uh, you know, go to school. We was, we break the whole education system. Fourteen year olds can do a bunch of different things, but but do they want to do that? And maybe forcing them to do these things via the state is something we should be doing, just because they they would rather just play Xbox all day. In the book, I talk about my actual realistic policy proposals, and then I go into my radical libertarian mode briefly, just to say on a section called "What I Really Think." So again, the main thing I'm pushing uh, is just cutting spending. Just spending less in order to encourage fewer people to go, fewer people to go, you know, do regular school at all levels. Now, in terms of what would Libertopia be like? Imagine a world where government, you know, there's a separation of school and state, and government doesn't have any role at all. So again, of course, the main people that will be involved in the lives of teens, uh, you know, like like in Libertopia as today, are their parents. So yeah, you know, their so their parents are unlikely to say I'm going to support you while you go and play Xbox for all this time. Their parents are going to be concerned about getting their kids to go ahead and uh, and prepare them for their future. So again, realistically, it's going to be parents that are going to be footing most of the bill, especially for younger kids. You know, yeah, again, like what about like you know, like you know, the kids with very responsible parents or kids who don't or kids who just don't you know, like orphans or things like that? There again, in Libertopia, the answer is always well, there's going to be private charity, scholarships, that kind of thing. Uh, again, it's worth pointing out that you know, like even, you know, even say you know, like like in the 1930s or 40s, it would still be very common for people in their mid-teens to become uh, to be self-supporting workers. So, you know, I think that is a much better world. You know, to to have one where 15-year-olds actually can afford to you know, have a job and can pay their rent and take care of themselves. And I think also just you know, in terms of you know, preparing people for life in a free society, I think it's uh, there's a great value in teaching people from an early age that the market is a place where they can independently sustain themselves. So, I mean, I, I've always had the view that, or long had the view that, the worst thing about the Great Depression for libertarians was just uh, you know, teaching pe teaching a whole generation of people that you could be doing everything right and yet still not be able to take care of yourselves. How does how do we then deal in such a system with? I don't know, call it the diamonds in the rough um, or the, you know, the stories that you hear of the kid who grew up poor um, and was, you know, really bad in school early on and then discovered that like one teacher who turned them on to something and they went on to, you know, Juilliard and to be, you know, a fantastic career as, you know, a musician or they discovered these these kind of soft talents that aren't the trade school things um, and that you know everyone if if we just kind of cut people off at the beginning and said well there's not you know we're not going to expose you to all of those skills how are we going to find those kids who have the capacity to do so much more or do we just have to say well you know it, we're going to lose some of them but it's better overall yeah so I mean, you know, the big point I would make is always, you know, so like, what would happen instead? So if people started their lives at a much earlier age, how would the whole world be different? So I mean, right now there are tons of people who never get to realize their dreams because they have to finish college to even get a chance. 
right? So, and in a system where educational levels are a lot lower, I think there's going to be a lot more learning by doing, a lot more chances for someone to just try and show what they're able to do. So it's always worth remembering, what have we lost with the current system? What we've lost is the chance for a 15-year-old to just go and become an apprentice and learn by doing. So, and like, you know, we, we tend to think, well, if they were any good, they would have gone to college. Probably there's plenty of people that would have been good on the job that just don't like college. And like, like that, you know, like, so on average, college graduates are better, but the averages don't describe everybody. So we, you know, we've lost so many opportunities right now with the current system. And then, yeah, does the current system also create some opportunities? Yes. Uh, so, you know, like my best friend at Princeton grew up in a log cabin uh, in, the, in the Poconos, and then they built it with their bare hands, or like, like they, I guess with saws. But, you know, like they, they built a log cabin in the winter in the mountains. They were that poor. And he's my best friend at Princeton. So, yeah, the system was great for him. But you should always do the thought experiment of what would, like, how would opportunity in general be affected, not – would one person that I know be worse off in a different system? So in the final calculus of the book, you, I mean, the book is incredibly empirical and it's, it's excellent. And you deal with all of the, uh, the counter arguments and everything we've been talking about here. But in the final calculus, would you be hazarding a guess of how much of education is signaling and how much is human capital? And then how much money are we wasting, do you think? Yeah, so my preferred uh, number is 80% of education is signaling. And and then you know and then and I would say and roughly that is a, is a pretty good estimate of the share of it that we're wasting. So, you know, you know like it would be about 700 billion dollars a year. It's billion with a B. So, I think that I think that's that's a very fair number from the taxpayer's point of view. And that's the that's about the US military budget, which is what yeah, yeah. what what Trump asked <laughs> for, which is which and you bring it up in the book, the uh, um it wouldn't it be great if the army had to what is it hold a bake sale to buy a bomb yeah, bumper sticker yeah. kind of thing it was like well actually we spend way more than that on the education system than the military which is which is the part of the point that that money could be used for a lot of things that are valuable yeah, yeah. i mean again i'm not pro military myself but still worth pointing out that we do spend more on education than on the military so when people act like the education system is starved that's demented and does it seem to you now, uh, some of these came up where maybe I I see anecdotally at least an increasing skepticism of college as a lot of these discussions are becoming more common and the idea of creating different apprenticeships and ways of verifying, you know, because signaling is important, you know, verifying that you can do things, but also having more human capital in it seems that we might have more technologies to do that and improve education going forward. So do you think that the tide is kind of turning in some sense against education just more and more and more all the time? I mean, we, we can't we can't add a, another layer to, you know, we, we, we went from high school to college, to college, and I got to go to grad school. But there's, there's not going to be grad, grad school. We can't add another, and people are going to have to grow up and start working. You by, stay you in know, your parents' before, insurance until you're in 45. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, is this the time to kind of, that things might start shifting, you know, not all of it, because as you said, it's so popular, just spending money on kids, but start shifting in a positive direction? Very marginally, maybe. I don't. I don't expect any big change immediately. So again, of course, I would love it if my book became a huge bestseller and changed the way that everyone on earth thinks about education. But realistically, that's not going to happen. Uh, so you know, there's a lot of resentment against education, but not the kind of resentment that's going to lead people to vote for a guy who says, "I'm going to cut the education budget by 10 percent." Yeah, you know, like so that that still seems really weird, and again, to a lot of people, it just seems like surrender. No, 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 don't cut spending and prove it. Even though, of course, people have been trying to improve the spending and improve education for, for since the beginning of the system, it's just that again the idea that the real problem is not so much the kind of education that we're giving, but just the total level is way too high. That's a very hard idea for people to accept. So I don't think that there's going to be any big change. I actually have a bet saying that the fraction of uh, of, of a recent high school graduates that will be in college is not going to go down by more than a marginal amount. Uh, in the book, I talk quite a bit about online education and whether that's going to change the system. I don't think so. Uh, you know, primarily just because right now, you know, if you have a kid that could go you know, do well in a regular college, and then he says, well, I could, but I'm just going to go to an online college, normal parents' reaction is, no, no, don't. You'll be shooting yourself in the foot, right? Because like we, you know, like, you know, right now, we still have the view the people doing the online education are people who have some issue with doing it the real way. 
right now. Again, I think online education is actually great for learning, but in terms of the single use end, still seems to be not very, still seems to be subpar. And again, as long as that's how, you know, how, how you know, what, what perceptions are like, then they will, they will be self-reinforcing. So, you know, and, and so like, uh, you know, on Wednesday when I'm speaking at Cato, uh, the respondent's going to be Kevin Carey, and he, uh, like in like in his work and at the end of college, talks quite a bit about well, we like first when online education first came along, we thought it was going to be like Napster was bringing the whole system down, and that didn't happen, and now we're focusing on credentialing because that seems so important. But again, there's the problem of coming up with credentials that people consider to be as good as regular ones is hard if the people that want to do something different are, are really are just trying to take the easy way out. So there's a long history of libertarians talking about education, um, some of it pretty reasonable, some of it pretty fringe and weird. Um, within that spectrum of libertarian views on the topic, where do you fit? How do your views compare to those of other libertarians? Right. So I would think of myself as much more on the radical wing, at least in terms of I say we should cut education spending, right? Yeah, and uh, it did by a lot. Now, in my view, so most libertarians who work in education don't want to say that. It's just a very uncomfortable and awkward position to take, and instead they want to focus more on things like how vouchers will go and improve the quality of the education system, give parental choice. But again, those vouchers are still being paid for by taxpayers. Uh, so, you know, in my mind, this is you know this is a lot like a debate about government subsidies for football stadiums. And I think of like you know the better libertarian view is cut the subsidies. Like government should not be going and picking winners and trying to, to force feed this industry. And I think of a lot of other libertarians are more like saying, look, we're not we we need to go and figure out a way to way to get better better stadiums with our money, or maybe we subcontract the construction of the stadiums. Again, which all may be an improvement, but doesn't really get to the heart of the matter, which is there's a huge waste of taxpayer money, and. There's no really good argument for why it is that we need to, that government should be going and taking taxpayer money and subsidizing this industry instead of, instead of just letting people spend their own money in their own way. Free Thoughts is produced by Tess Terrible. If you enjoyed today's show, please rate and review us on iTunes. And if you'd like to learn more about libertarianism, find us on the web at www.libertarianism.org.